Well, hello and welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price. I'm your host. Cool episode coming up today. First, I'll get to a couple of landing pages to point you towards, and then we'll jump into our participants' bio and then get started. So first things first, check out The Sacred Speaks at thesacredspeaks.com. And also look up The Center. This podcast is sponsored by the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences, a boutique integrative wellness practice that my wife and I started many moons ago. And uh, we've got a lot of cool things happening there, including a membership model uh, that's a subscription-based spiritual practice. And uh, it's, it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, we're not live yet, so I'm just stirring the pot here a little bit. But what I will be doing is offering a trial membership for Sacred Speaks participants for a few months, because I'll be hosting a bi-weekly group that will happen that will be for the Sacred Speaks community, behind the scenes, deep conversations, conversations about upcoming work, conversations about historical work, and uh, we'll start to stir the pot there. There's going to be a server online. You can participate and communicate, post things, and also we'll meet on a live stream every two weeks. Uh, But then we'll also have a lot of other meetings regarding sacred relationship, sacred masculine, feminine, sacred money and work, uh, sacred spiritual practice, uh, and a number of other groups, along with some evergreen content, and then daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal, and annual events and content. So that is rolling out very soon, and I believe as of two weeks from now, the Sacred Speaks community will gain access to this opportunity, and it will be a two-month uh, trial membership that you can just dig into for free. Check it out. And also support it, because we're building the community. That'd be great to have everybody involved. Okay, so also check out the Young Center at younghouston.org. Spot in Houston, if you're ever down here, go check it out. Uh, The music is from Modern Nations on The Sacred Speaks. So check them out at modernnationsmusic.com. Hang out till the end of the episode, and you'll hear this whole song, the theme song from The Sacred Speaks, called Clouds. Uh, Also, Greg Wren is today's... Participant, check him out at Greg Wren, G R E G W R E N N dot com, and his book Mothership. He is fantastic. His writing, as you'll hear me gush about it, is amazing, and the book is moving. I I I can't say enough wonderful things about this book. Um, it's Mothership: A Memoir of Wonder and Crisis, an evidence-based account of his turning to coral reef and plant medicines to heal childhood trauma. And it was great to get to know Greg. Greg, thank you very much for participating. And Rachel, thank you for pointing Greg this direction. Uh, yeah, we get we get deep on all kinds of stuff, from writing to ayahuasca to psychodynamics and family systems and creativity and poetry, um, modern mental health, and um, the link between ecology and personal well-being. So I'll read his bio. Greg, a former Stegner Fellow and Jones Lecturer at Stanford University. He's an author of Ayahuasca, Eco-Memoir, Mothership, an evidence-based account of his turning coral reef and plant medicines to heal from childhood trauma, and Centaur, which, which won, was the National Book Award-winning poet Terence Hayes Award and the Britain Prize. Greg's work has appeared or is forthcoming in HuffPost, The New Republic, Al Jazeera, The Rumpus, Lit Hub, Writer's Digest, Kenyon Review, New England, New England Review, The Iowa Review, and elsewhere. He's received awards and fellowships for the James Merrill House, the Bread Loaf Writers Conference and Vermont Studio Center, the Poetry Society of America, the Hermitage Artist Retreat, and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, and the Spiro Arts Center. Wow, great. As an associate English professor at James Madison University, he teaches creative nonfiction poetry and environmental literature. He also teaches in the Low Residency MFA program at Bennington Writing Seminars and in the Memoir Certificate program at Stanford Continuing Studies. He was educated at Harvard University and Washington University in St. Louis. Greg is currently sending out Homesick, his second poetry collection, a student of ayahuasca since 2019. He's a trained yoga teacher and Patty advanced open water diver. Having explored coral reefs around the world for over 25 years, he and his husband live in the mountains of Virginia, the ancestral land of the Manahoac and the Monacan people. Well done. Thanks for that. All right. Stay tuned. Hang out. Greg, thanks again. And for now, we'll leave it there. Go check out the Center's website, and you'll see um, access to the membership model. But on the Sacred Speaks, be looking in about two weeks on the Sacred Speaks website for the uh, 
the incentive to bring in folks in this community. And for now, we'll leave it there. Enjoy the show. Greg Wren, like the bird. Uh, it, it's really good to see. We're going to have a, 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 I can already tell, just an enriching, um, expansive conversation. And I could know that given the work that you've produced and put out to the world. It's really, as I was sharing, I was kind of gushing about, or I was totally gushing about how um, uh, the book really touched a, a lot for me. And I'm, I'm carrying, I'm carrying what you stirred up throughout the day into my clinical practice. And I just think that there's a degree of honesty and openness and clarity and your written word is exceptionally crafted. And so I, I'm, I, it, it I, I was so happy that you're the carrier of this vision, given how the handle that you have on language, it's really good to be with you today. Um, your book is Mothership and I'll, I'll spy at the, uh, a memoir of wonder and crisis, Greg mm -hmm. Wren, and thanks for sending it here. Um, I can't wait to talk about it. I got a load of questions, so it's good to be with you. It's great to be with you. It's it's such a pleasure, such yeah. an honor. A world of firsts, yes. And you've got a great beard. Oh, well, the, yes, as you, yes. Thank yeah, you, it's, thank you. You know, thank it's you. funny, like, just as a side note, I, I, I talk to a lot of guys about beards, you know, and yeah. my, I lead a, a, I facilitate a men's group with um, a, a man who has studied the beard and he looked, he's a, he's a Jungian analyst and he, that's what Jungian analysts do is just geek out over like the pocket or the beard or, you know, mm -hmm. these symbols that are found. And it, it's a, it's a way for men to speak intimately about our bodies in a way that is, um, uh, is affirming and intimate, but safe also. And it's, wow. it's interesting where I'll, I'll go out into the world and I'll have these like, May, you know, guy's guy, like oil derrick worker dudes that like walk by and like nice beard. You know, you're like, yeah, that's yeah. So it's it's fun to 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 be bearded dudes. You know, definitely like Papa Smurf. Like Papa Smurf, man. What a good image. And all uh, uh, long long line of bearded bearded sages out there. Uh, yes. Well, that's the that's what we're constellating, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so your book, as I was sharing, is you know, this mem it's a memoir, but I, I really got hit very quickly, obviously, that you begin in the psychodynamics of your life. And I, I had this really cool, have you seen Darren Aronofsky's film, Mother? No, I haven't. Oh, yeah. So Darren Aronofsky, while he was shooting this film, Mother, which is radical, it's so good. Um, he was also shooting One Strange Rock, which is kind of like planet Earth, you know, it's this... Um, uh, the biography of earth, you know, and, and he did it. It's such a great job. I love his filmmaking, but I, I had that experience as you were, as you're writing where I'm thinking about how you have the psychodynamics of your early life with your mother. And then the, this broader relationship with the mother earth mm -hmm. and, and that interplay of uh, your, your personal experience. So I, I'd love for you to just take a stab at introducing this narrative um, your personal, social, academic, sexual, you know, mm -hmm. uh, confrontation of trauma and, and just talking about the process that you underwent to create this, this book that you're offering to the world. Oh gosh. Well, do you mind if I read oh, just please. a little bit, um, up from it? Because I think this is a really good way into the, into this conversation. Nice. Um, and this is this is very early in the book, um, and uh, yeah, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and so I was surrounded by water all my life. Hmm. And my first word was aquatic, in nature. So chapter two is called row. So I'll read maybe two or three minutes. Uh, from from this from this chapter it's just i think it's a good way good way in row my first word when my mother sang me the nursery rhyme she pretended to paddle a boat with her arms i set it in our brick house with blue shutters which was on a wide point where the saint john's river turns and flows 10 miles to the sea 
Mornings often smelled of coffee from the Maxwell House factory. But if the breeze was right, we could smell the brackish tannins of the river, its saltier mouth, conjuring a place much safer than that house. Mm. A place of cord grass and clams and whiskered manatees. Mermen who re only rescue children who believe. I couldn't quite pronounce the R in row, so did it sound more like O, a faint grunt of delight or pain? In any case, it was my own. It created my universe, bizarre galaxies of hard water, declaring me a strange child, a disloyal Muppet designed to conspire with the singing tides. Not Dada or Mama, but Ro. Life is but a dream, an echo of a dream, as when you put a conch to your ear. If Ro was my essential seed syllable, clean was my mother's. Her hands were so red and cracked from washing that in winter she wore rubber gloves filled with ointment to bed. After she showered, she wouldn't touch me. When wet wipes were on sale at Publix, she would buy so many the cashier would ask if she owned a daycare. She used them to wipe off the groceries before putting them away, my dresser drawers at summer camp, every toy that left the house and tried to come back inside. But my favorite toys, like my Inspector Gadget doll and my teddy bear feral, she wouldn't clean for months at a time. Instead, she kept them in a heap in her mildewy bedroom. I could look, but I couldn't touch. I used to blame myself because I was so big, she needed many stitches after I was born. It was the worst pain of my life, she said at my birth, and you should have been a C-section, teaching me the word episiotomy from an early age, reminding me how gross it was for her postpartum in the bathroom. She called me her bouncing baby boy, her Gregory Peggery, but I was also Pigpen from Peanuts in a poopy cloud of dirt. Gregory the Terrible Eater, the renegade goat from the children's book. Hitting me with her wooden spoon, she called me other names and said, I'm going to spank the living daylights out of you. Couldn't my soul have been cleaned instead of driven away? As a child, I found it hard to sleep at night. My docks, my door's lock had been disabled. A man I thought was watching me. From my bed, there was so much I couldn't perceive, such as marsh, oys marsh oysters beating algae into the mucus of their gills, fiddler crabs blowing bubbles in order to breathe on land, our power plant burning coal, nuggets of paleozoic trees, and my mother, with her talking stuffed animal, who must have been asking God to help us. If I listened hard enough, though, I could make out the barges blowing their horns as if they were Poseidon's sons, messengers of upcurrents, undertow, and ceaseless change. I could hear drips in the drain of our bathtub. The next day it would be refilled with water from the ancient aquifer below. So, yes, Roe, I guess you could say, was my ohm. It was my original seed syllable. Mm -hmm. And for my mother, her mantra, I guess you could say, her seed syllable was clean. And um, that took on some pretty horrifying uh, manifestations. Um, and I'm still here. Yeah. It, it, did, how much therapy have you done, Greg? A lot of therapy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a lot know, of therapy. <laughs> it, it's odd for me to read somebody in, in your department, so to speak, in, yes. in the academy with yes. such obvious language of the psychodynamic and the therapeutic. And I was even sharing with my brother when I was talking to him about your book. I said, you know, it's really nice and refreshing. He's got these great references to to uh, this, this throughout your book you peppered in a couple of really fantastic references but you also have a sophistication of self-knowledge that 
um, is hard earned. I had to. Yeah, I, I feel like I had to. I had to to survive. I had to have a very clear sense of self. You know, the opposite can happen with people where they have no sense of self when they're in a traumatic um, uh, environment from which they can't escape. But yeah. for me, I uh, I had a clear sense of self, and that was so related to language. You know, language was performative in that way for me because it it conjured not only other realms, um, but it like through literature, writing, but it also um, it also helped me continually define myself and redefine myself. Um, Well, I want I want to clarify something that you and I chatted about. You know, there's in, in in to use the language of psychotherapy, there's a difference between process and content. That's also very Buddhist, you know. So mm -hmm. today, I think for for our purposes, there's there's no need to talk content, but there is a mm -hmm. um, that's we forget that content is often confidential and sacred and deserving of right connected relationship to share. And so, mm -hmm. but you're moving into some pretty vulnerable places as, as you've written this book. So the process that we're talking about of how you found a self, yeah. because certainly you narrativize the evolution of your identity, of your sexuality, of the, the, the ways in which you present in the world as a friend and in relationship, you know, like I, that's what I, I think that because you started in such a personal place, I, I I accept the invitation, hopefully, to start sure. here today in, sure. in that personal space sure. and your hard-earned self-awareness. So could you contextualize that a little bit as far as process is concerned? What, what this first kind of uh, portion of your life... Um, uh, well, I, let me tangent for one second. You, you mm -hmm. had a really significant remark on post-traumatic stress and complex trauma. Yes. But something that stood out so horrifically and beautifully is that the captivity that happens yes. when a child is living with a dysregulated unconscious human being that is their parent or their mm -hmm. caregiver. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think, I think I, I, I rebelled against that unconsciousness and I rebelled against that, um, that kind of sleepwalking through life you know, where you're not really paying attention to what's going on inside you and you're just acting out the trauma that you've inherited, right? And I, so I saw that mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. I think I, uh, I, I rebelled against it. You know, there was always a rebellious streak in me. Even as I looked like the golden child, I, I was, <laughs> I, I, was actually, I, I was actually uh, quite, always very subversive in a lot of ways. And I think, I think just my identity is, was a subversive kind of um, construction. And um, and so I think educating myself was part of the process, you know, uh, reading as much as I could and uh, turning to my teachers to be surrogate parents. Now, of course, I didn't, I didn't know that. I wasn't consciously doing that. I have, I have my own unconscious salmon you know, swimming up the stream uh, aspects to myself, as we all do. And as a child, I certainly did. But I, 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 I was as drawn to my teachers and whatever wisdom they could offer me as strongly as a salmon knows it has to go back up into the river. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just so powerful in me. I mean, I was teacher's pet. I was the brown noser. I was called all the names, you know. And I think people, you know, my classmates, you know, sometimes thought that I was, uh, I don't know, just a kiss up to be a kiss up, but, but, it, but really it was, it was a way to survive. It was a way yeah. to, um, to get parenting. It was a way to get parenting. Yeah. It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was a way to get, um, adults to believe in me. And those adults happened to also be teaching me how to diagram sentences and 
think critically about poetry and um, and they taught me biology. You know, I had a I had a really fantastic science teacher in ninth grade who was a biology teacher, and she, she her name was Mrs. Durant, and she also um, was one of the coaches of the the crew team, and she unsuccessfully tried to get me to join <laughs> convert but you the, to crew. <laughs> yes, but there was something so upright about her, and so organized, and so mm-hmm. contained in her you know, teacherly pedagogical persona and and I always and there was grit to her you know and I I saw that and I I emulated it and I also in the process learned to love um, the natural world I had many wonderful science teachers Mrs. Bursinger and Mrs. Wies- Mr. Wieseke and Mrs. Durant I had some really wonderful science teachers who encouraged me to, to join the science fair so that's why, you know, in this in this book, you there is so much science because I love I love science and 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 but I also loved more than anything my English teachers and and they loved me. And um and that was how I felt safe and that's how I learned to get social re- rewards. I wasn't getting get social rewards mm-hmm. from being on the basketball team, even though I'm six four. It, it was never gonna ha- it was never gonna happen. That was never gonna happen. People would say, "Do you play basketball?" And I would say, "Do you play mini golf?" You know, <laughs> so because they were usually short. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, that's that's where I found my home. That's where I felt, felt a, 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 that's where I felt a sense of belonging. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't have that I didn't feel that at home. I didn't, I didn't feel well, that at home. I, just like just like many the, people, you know. I just like many oh, people. well, yeah. Yeah, blessing and curse, right? Because we we need to leave home and we don't want to leave home. And yeah, uh, but the, the but let's go back to the row piece because sure, the I, I, what what do you think is important for people to know about your experience of mother and mothering? Mm. Um, because yeah, let's narrativize that a little bit because mm-hmm. the beauty sure. of how you found mothering. Yes. This is a good distinction that we, we will be mothered in all kinds of ways. Mm-hmm. And and you you found mother in nature and in teachers and in language. And that's beautiful. So can we mm-hmm. go back a bit and talk about how that happened? Well, I think I think I should say I should mark that my mother was she she could be um very caring you know she could be very caring she could be um you know as i say in the book she kind of turned the house into north pole into the north pole at christmas and and birthdays were um were were so exciting and and so full of joy um uh but my mom was my mom was my mom was sick and she 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 didn't know how to get help and I, in turn, because of my childhood, became sick and, you know, needed, um, needed help. And fortunately, I found it. Um, so, so I had, I had some real tastes of that as a kid, like that, of, of like a, a present loving mom, but it was just sort of like, so random it would so randomly appear and then she would return to her other, her other personality or other, other way of being. Um, but I found mothering, um, I'm looking at her photograph right now. Um, I found mothering in my grandmother. It was my mother's mother. Mm. And she was, she was such a special, special, special woman who, um, loved me so much and she and I would you know um in her in her bedroom this is in Vero Beach Florida in her bedroom she had as they used to do I guess on I Love Lucy and 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 back in the day right there were two beds and so when we would go to, to visit her I would take one bed and she would be in her bed and we would just talk and talk and talk into the night and I could hold her hand um mm-hmm. And she told me about um, what I call in the book, what I call the rinsed gleam of the, of the Teton mountains a hundred years ago, 
you know, the Grand Teton Mountains a, a century, over a century ago. Um, you know, she'd tell me about the bobcats that were in her, in the jungle, in her backyard in Southern Florida. Um, she would talk, just tell me, she would tell me about our ancestors. So I had a sense of, uh, that there was this matrilineal line in my family. Um, mm. and so she, and she just, like with, with a few exceptions, she was always just a loving, present, um, person. And when I look back, you know, that was, that was the divine mother. I mean, the divine mother takes many, I know we're jumping ahead now to, to mm-hmm. the divine mother, but this is the sacred speaks. So, so, but, but I, f- I feel like she, she really transmitted to me, um, what unconditional love is, mm. you know, even though she wasn't perfect either. She, she, she gave me so many tastes of that, that I remembered it. And so I knew that was, I knew that was part of the human experience. And I knew that my work um, as a CPTSD, complex PTSD survivor, I knew that my work was to reclaim that feeling of unconditional love and to, um, and, and to, to truly claim it as my own and to find a way to um, plug back into it. But I knew that it didn't involve another person. It didn't involve really another human being. At the end of the day, it was something, it was an entity, it was invisible, it was, um, it was Durga Ma. I mean, I didn't have those words, but it was Durga right. Ma, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was Mary, it was um, Pachamama, you know, all these different, all these different manifestations of, of the divine feminine. And, uh, and so my quest, knowingly or unknowingly, in my, in my adult life, in adolescence and adult life was to, was to, to, to find that again. And I was desperate to find it. And my addiction, my addictions were, were attempts to find that too. Of course, they didn't work out. <laughs> well, that's certainly an area that we want to talk about. Um, but this, the, yeah, this, this is an interesting link here about mm-hmm. the psychodynamics of your early childhood and your personal history and your relationship to ecology. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, if, if I could kind of, you know, bury the lead or going to jump ahead a little bit. You, you sure. talked about the person as ecological and ecology as, you know, this interdynamic. Um, and so uh, two thoughts that come to mind. I, I heard Alan Watts one time say something about how in earlier, um, in earlier times and earlier societies, the, the organized structures of the culture didn't initiate you. You went off and were initiated by nature. And that, thread certainly shows up in your book. You know, you you have this um, reverence for nature and you certainly took your took your problems, took your issues, took your tension and took it into these sacred spaces where there wasn't the other relational, there was the great other. Um, and so that's a pretty unique, and, and with your writing skills to be able to, to write about it in the way that you have, that's a I think that's why I just was so moved by your book is just to get a glimpse into this reality of allowing nature to initiate us. Um, so mm. what, 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 what else is important for any of us as kind of participants here in this narrative mm. of yours? Mm. What, what else is important for us to explore as we talk through this childhood ecology, mm-hmm. mother, self? Well, I think, I think another thing definitely to talk about is, so, so the book is, <clears throat> The book is about, uh, you know, how I turn to endangered coral reefs and ayahuasca, psychedelic plants, uh, to save my life and heal from complex trauma, and my ecological conscience woke up as a result. Um, so the ocean is really important. And, and you know, and, and I think in, I think, I believe in French, uh, mer is... Is that right? I think mare is, it's, it's, it's like the same, the same word for ocean is the same word for mother. I think so. In mm. any case, the, the, the ocean is seen in so many cultures as, as a, as a mother, you know, as a, as a, as a mm. woman. And of course the, the amniotic fluid in the, 
in the in the uterus is while while not chemically identical to the ocean, contrary to popular belief, it's analogous to it. And and so I floated, you floated around for for months at a time in there, and and I think uh, I think the ocean was a way to also feel safe. You know, a lot of people are afraid of the ocean. And growing up in Florida, I wasn't really afraid of the ocean. I love being in the ocean, mm. and, and we would and we would snorkel. Uh, in Florida, and and I was exposed to coral reefs. I, I saw my first coral reef when I was about nine, and I was with my mom. And um, in fact, there was on our first snorkel, there was a statue of Jesus that was like this. He was standing up on the ocean floor. He was he was it was a bronze statue that had been sunk there intentionally, and and the the you know Jesus was like this. And he looked like he was imitating Elkhorn coral. Mm -hmm. That was that was the that was the the the, the pose that he was in. And so, um, you know, so from an early age, the sacred and the oceanic were very you know very tied together. And um, so the ocean was it was a place of of I guess you could say remothering. It was a place of initiation. I um, had a lot of ear infections as a kid, and so. Um, uh, it was, you know, my mom would tell me it was dangerous for me to go into the water and I had to wear earplugs and a swim cap and it was very cumbersome and cumbersome, but I still did it. And, um, and it was a place I felt free. It was a place I could forget my body. It was a place where I could baptize myself mm -hmm. and feel clean because that's one of the hallmarks of being uh, a survivor of childhood, um, sexual abuse is that you feel dirty you constantly feel dirty you feel impossible to clean and so um this you know this 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 watery realm of the ocean was a place to to do that and almost dissolve some of that mm -hmm. some of those um he, some of the heebie-jeebies <laughs> so uh so the ocean was really important for me and and then but but I should say when I when when my mother and I were snorkeling together at this this first time in the Florida Keys, you know, this was in the late '80s, and even then, those reefs were dying. We showed up too late. Had we been had we been there ten years before, they would have been much much more beautiful, and much more pristine. And and um, so when we showed up that day, um, you know, in 1989, it was those reefs were. Were, were quite dead. Um, there was still some living coral, but but they were they were an, a shadow of their former self. And so, I guess in, in a way, that that statue of Jesus, which kind of brought so you know for in my mind associated the sacred and the oceanic, it also, I guess, I, I was when on that on that dive on on, the, on that snorkel trip, I I felt. Um, I felt so worried for that, for that ecosystem. I knew, I knew that that reef was in trouble. I, I, this is something I just knew. No one told me that. No one was talking about global warming. No one was talking about coral bleaching. No one was, talk, no one was talking about coral diseases. Um, it was something that I just knew in my gut. And I think that for me to... Like I, as I grew up, I think I looked back on those experiences, and I, I, in that in the weird way that people think, I just thought, well, if I could find a, if I could find a, a coral reef that wasn't destroyed, right? Because 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 now coral is it's like a, it's a there's coral coverage in Florida is like down to one percent. I mean, there's just almost almost none. No one no one understands that really because they've forgotten. We forget. And so, but, but part of me thought if I could find a reef somewhere on the planet that uh, was healthy, that was intact, then, right, this is how our minds work, then I could somehow uh, be okay again. Somehow that, you know, that trauma circuitry could just be pulled out of my brain. You know, I would not, not only, if I found an intact reef, then somehow... I would be restored to my 
factory settings, I guess you could say, before the 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 the, the worst of the trauma of childhood happened. And so um, that was my quest for a long time, you know. I guess, and so I was, I was, so I ended up in in Indonesia, and uh, you know, as an adult, and and in Raja Ampat, which does have intact reefs, one of the few in the world left, and I did feel remothered, and I did, I was taught a lot of things that I can't even talk about. I don't know how to talk about there underwater, um, about my self worth, and about my basic dignity, and things that you would learn from a mother, mm. you know, to, to, to appreciate life more, you know? Well, you, I mean, you followed it. You really followed the thread. The, this, you, can, um, you can kind of see what I, you can kind of see what I mean in terms of that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, just, just to, to follow that, that, um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it was called a psychopomp, you know, like you had a, you had an image and mm -hmm. you, went after it and you've, you discovered something really profoundly powerful in Coral. That's, I mean, a lot of folks don't honor their inner world enough to actually engage mm -hmm. in the adventure of this path that, I mean, it reminds me of the alchemist, you know, you got to go all the mm -hmm. way out there to discover this stuff, you know, um, that's beautiful. Well, I think that's part of my, I think that's part of my poetry background and poetry training which is that you privilege the inner world over the outer world. It doesn't matter what's going on out here. What matters is what's going on in here. What matters is the life of dreams, the life of the imagination. Mm -hmm. That's what's important. And so those, those, those symbols or those uh, uh, motifs or tropes or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, psychopomps, you know, that, that were clear to me, like I just, I, I knew as a, you know, as a, as a, because of my poetry training, I knew to follow that. Yeah, wow. Well. I just, I just knew to follow that, and and so, I, uh, and I, I didn't, I just didn't question a lot. And you know, and my mom, my mom, weirdly, my mom taught me to believe in myself. It's all very strange, right? Like she believed mm -hmm. in me as a student. She was, she was an award-winning elementary school teacher. She was, um just so such a champion of my academic life. And so I, a lot of people don't have that. And that was, that was a huge gift that I, that I had. And so that enabled me to not second guess myself when I said, okay, I'm going to rack up a credit card bill. I can't pay. And I'm going to go to Indonesia and see, see what happens. Um, and uh, so impractical. Yeah. So impractical. <laughs> well, yes. So I'm glad you I'm glad you brought your poetry in because I I have this question about language and because uh, you currently your profession is you're a professor correct teacher mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I'm an English professor so, you teach English yes so yeah. you're and I have a question about that later but I think it's important because you're you really do for anybody anybody listening or watching read the book it it it's a it's incredible to, to find somebody who, like, I don't have that gift. I mean, I, like, you're, to study this as long as you have, to be in mm -hmm. the pocket of language, and it, it's just so evident. So we talk about what language is and what mm -hmm. po the poetic, like, what does it mean to poetry to you? And um, what do you notice about your students that come in and what processes they have to go through to understand language, how language heals, and so on and so forth? It's very hard to get them to to privilege their inner world over their outer one. It's very hard to do this. It's very hard to do this because they've been subjected to these, you know, standards of learning tests and no child left behind tests and mm. fill in the bubble and fill in the blank. And there's only mm. really one answer that goes in that blank and horrible and horrible, horrible. I'm in Texas. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. Okay. That how you, yeah, Texas how you is great. Do, how you doing over ways. there? Yeah. <laughs> Texas is great in a lot of ways. Full disclaimer, like I really love this place. Don't mess man, with it. Yes. I mean this this education piece is really it's really tough. Mm -hmm. It's very tough. tough. It's very tough. Yeah. And so um, you know, as a as a proud Floridian, uh, you know, <laughs> like, right? Uh, same we're brothers. We're you know we're brothers, uh same line of latitude, I think, more or less. So uh, yeah. so yeah, as a proud, you're a proud Texan. I'm a proud Floridian. 
you know, yeah, I can say that they're, um, yeah, my, my, my students are, are, their world is so digital and it's so, mm -hmm. um, and th they don't have to use their imaginations anymore. Oh. They don't have to, and they, and they aren't really asked to, I mean, they're asked to in very elementary ways, but they're not, they're not, um, you know, sitting under the, under the tree, looking up at the clouds by and large, they're not doing that, you know, stop wasting your time They're doing something we can monetize or something that's, that's, that's going to be useful. Um, so, or, you know, they're looking down at their phones. So, so it's, it's, um, yeah. So, so you're helping John, you're helping me really appreciate, you know, what I got in childhood. Isn't that, mm -hmm. isn't that wild? Like, because it, it was in some ways, a, it was a really difficult childhood, um, but it was also there were there were blessings um, that are incalculable, uh, priceless priceless gifts that I was given um, because because my, my you know my, my my parents believed in me as a you know as a as a student they didn't understand what I was thinking about really or talking about or writing about but they just trusted the process they trusted my teachers um and they encouraged me to read and they told me that the nintendo would break the television so we never got one <laughs> now that was a lie i am grateful they told me yeah very grateful for that lie because i didn't spend my life on playing video games um but i i found i found refuge you know i found refuge in in language and and in and in schoolwork and um and that helped me that helped me survive that helped me survive yeah what do you what do you think writing poetry is about what what, what is what is that well i think poetry is i think poetry is singing I think poetry is singing. I think poetry is, is you are, you're not speaking. I mean, it's, you are, I mean, it seems like you're speaking, right? You're not, there's not a melody so, seemingly to a poem or accompaniment or anything or no instruments. But of course, in, of course, in ancient Greece, where lyric poetry was invented, lyric coming from the, the word lyre, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, the instrument of the lyre, you know, poems used to be, they did have accompaniment. They were sung. They were deeply felt. And so a poem is, uh, a poem is a song. It's a, it's a, and what is a song? A song is mm -hmm. not a press conference. Singing is, is not a press conference. Singing is not reading the encyclopedia. There are lots of things that it's not, you know, you know, you know it when you hear a song. Mm -hmm. And you you move you you want you feel it in your body and and in the best poems you have that somatic um, experience just as you do at a Grateful Dead concert you know you, you have a somatic you have a somatic experience so a poem is um, a poem is a song and it's um, it's uh, it's an invitation to go somewhere totally different than where you are. It's an opportunity to step into someone else's shoes. And in stepping into those shoes, you see that those are, oh, wait, those are my shoes. I thought they were someone else's, but those are my, ultimately, it's all the same shoe. And so, because it's the human experience. So there's a, there's a beautiful kind of compassion practice that happens with poetry but, you know, an, another way to think about it, just another way to think about it would be that a poem is, um, a poem is a controlled explosion. <laughs> mm -hmm. a, a poem is a controlled explosion. And, and, and so a poem and what's being exploded, what's being destroyed, you know, what is the, what is the Kool-Aid man kind of jumping through and destroying? Well, he's with, with, with a poem is, 
is is the consensus reality is 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 mm. is the habituated way of looking at life uh the cliched way of 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 thinking and and feeling because and then we wake up we stop being unconscious i talked about sleepwalking earlier mm. we wake up from the trance and we we see the world with the freshest eyes and that is um that's why we're here i think is is to to look with fresh eyes. I was talking to a guy once named Walter Hanengraf. He's a the chair of esotericism at at the University of Amsterdam. It was just radical stuff. And we had a long conversation about about this re, rebirth, you know, baptism, this baptismal theme you're working with. Mm -hmm. And he said that Diotima, who is Plato's teacher, this female teacher, that she said, you don't escape the cave. She said, you, this is very feminine. You know, she said, you know, you go into the cave to give birth, you know, and, and it's a, such a deeper image than, um, uh, so this act of creation to create new birth or new eyes to go into the darkness yes. um, as opposed to escape it. And I always thought that that just sets us up on a different, I don't know, on a different trajectory. Um, and it, but it sounds like that's exactly what you did. You so your cave was in the coral. Mm hmm. My cave was in the coral, and um, because I, I guess I, um, I'm not the person I used to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not the person I used to be. Something else. I mean, I'm some. I'm not, I'm the same. I mean, I'm the same person. I guess in some ways, but but I'm not. I you know I wake up sometimes. I think after after all of these all these experiences of being underwater and, and, you know, I guess diving into the ocean and then diving into the psyche the way I've done mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. using plant mm -hmm. medicines, um, being on meditation retreats, you know, I've done this for so long that, that I, you know, I've had some, some pretty radical shifts in my, in my being in the past, you know, three or four years. And I, I don't know who I am sometimes anymore and I don't care because mm -hmm. I don't think that the point of my life is to figure out who I am. The point of my life is to be love, to 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 tap into love and to to sink into that and radiate love, just like you're radiating radiating love right now, you know, just like that's that's why we're here is to radiate love, and that sounds trite, that sounds like a very privileged position <laughs> to take, I guess, but I know some um, I know some uh, underprivileged folks that would totally agree. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i don't have kids yeah. so i don't you know i'm not yeah. running around with with you know taking care of kids or anything but but uh so i, I have a little less to do but i'll tell you promoting a book takes a lot of work um yeah. so it's moisturizing but anyway <laughs> it's a joke but uh yeah <laughs> but but you know? yeah but but i i think just so much so much has so much has changed in my life that i i i'm I just i don't want to i don't I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just not as interested in my neuroses. I'm not as interested in um, writing kind of Sylvia Plath like poems about my family of origin or something like that. I, I, I just, I want to, I want to learn. I'm still learning how to, I, I feel like the, the purpose of life is to, um, is to open as absolutely and totally as possible. And not in five seconds, not in five years, mm -hmm. but right now. And to stop making excuses about it. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, like just be here now, wake up, wake up from the trance. And that's, I think that's why, I, that's what I'm using, trying to use language to do because, because in writing this book, it woke me up. To some mm -hmm. things right it, it woke me up to the ecological crisis in a way that i didn't understand before like the very act of writing it did that like i knew it in my head but to actually write this book and go through that you talked about process to go through that process that is what caused me to um to upend business as usual in my own life and so i want my readers to feel what I felt. I want to transmit the beauty of these reefs, these endangered 
gorgeous, these imperiled, gorgeous reefs. I want to transmit this beauty and their fragility to my <laughs> readers who will probably never go there. Mm -hmm. I want my readers to know what it's like to be um, on an ayahuasca journey, not as a Joe Rogan, um, uh, Joe Rogan worshiping um, person looking for the next high, but as not, but as a psychiatric patient, right? As someone who has real deep seated psychological problems that they need taken care of. That's one of my aims. Like I want to know what it's like. I want folks to know what it's like to be a patient of sorts mm -hmm. and be uh, on these journeys with ayahuasca. But I also want them to know what it's, what it's like to, um, to experience a plant medicine like that as a sacrament so that the therapeutic and the sacramental, the psychiatric and uh, the spiritual, so that that becomes a lot, so that, so that, so that that's collapsed, you know? And right. so that's that, so that, so I'm harnessing language to try and, to try and do that. That's, that's my aim, but, but it happened in me first, like, right. I had to, I had to write the book really and go through these experiences to, to just kind of wake up just to, just to let go of some of this garbage that I had in my mind that I thought was true. That wasn't, it was just mm -hmm. garbage. I had, um, my, my next heading for the questions that I want to ask you is psychedelics <laughs> and spiritual insights. So <laughs> it's perfect. You're like, so the, the, the narrative of your book is, is really, you offer up really, as I said, resource, um, research on psychedelics mm -hmm. and its intersection with spirituality and religion. And you're also talking an important aspect of therapy. So what significant shifts or insights are you seeing that are emerging in the field? And I, I'm really opening up a conversation about yeah. your connection with psychedelics and ayahuasca in particular, how you yes. discovered them, your experience through mm -hmm. the process. And, and then we can talk about what's going on in the current sure. space, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So you, I just, this, this word process that you, that you introduced John or earlier, um, you, you highlighted it, you know, it's, it's, I, I yeah, I, I, I see what you, what you're, what you're getting at there. And, and we're, um, we're in the habit of checking things off on our to-do list. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get, get her done, as they say, as Jeff Foxworthy, you might say, <laughs> get her done. <laughs> We're trying to get her done uh, here in our culture. There's it's the it's the hustle mm -hmm. of hustles that we're engaged in, um, and it's a distraction from a disintegrating social fabric and mm. uh, disintegrating ecological balance. But but that's that's I'll put that aside for a second. But but yes, we, what we've lost is, and what I have, you know, what, what I'm still trying to reclaim, right? What I'm still trying to reclaim, but that I feel like I have touched on a little bit or experienced some is, is that, um, and what I try and teach in my students is that it's the process that's important. That a poem is not to be, to your point, a poem is not to be read. A poem is to be undergone. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. And that... And that the most meaningful experiences in life, the most tra transformative experiences in life are not always pleasant and they are akin to surgery. Mm -hmm. They're akin to surgery. And I don't mean getting a mole taken off of your mm -hmm. back, right? I mean something much, much more <laughs> invasive and, uh, and, and, where, where you don't know what the outcome is necessarily going to be. You don't know if you're going to make it, so to speak. Um, and so, so writing a poem, you don't, if you know what the, how, if you know how a poem is going to end before you even write it, then it's, it's over. Like why, why even, why even do that? You know, that's, 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 we, we want a sense of adventure. 
Mm-hmm. We want a sense of adventure with Google, even with Google Maps. You know, it's like I can't get lost anymore. You know, I can't get lost even when there's no Wi-Fi. It still knows where I am and it still takes me where it needs to take me. I, I can't get lost anymore. You know, I can't get lost anymore. And and so we need to be able to get lost. We need to be able to um, we need to be able to look out the window at the trees and not know what's next. We need to learn how to daydream again. We need to learn how to make love, not just to get off, but to literally make love. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many, you know, being in nature. You, 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 you talked to me a little earlier about being in nature after you finished my book and, 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 and being out there outside and, yeah. and you didn't have an agenda. You were, you were just by your compost heap and you were letting the Texan afternoon do what the Texan afternoon wanted to do mm-hmm. as the microbes did their work in your compost heap. You know, you, you didn't have any, you weren't directing that and you didn't have to, thank goodness. So it's uh yeah it's it's startling how in our age we've 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 lost a sense of process and we only want profit we think about the bottom line we think about the destination and that is um that's a sickness that's a terminal illness actually and so this is why this book has been this is why i wrote this book is because in in experiencing the things I've experienced and in being a writer and working with my students and so forth, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned because uh, we are we are really sick and the sickness is um, is everywhere and it's in myself as well. Of course, it's in myself. I fight against it, but it's still there. And so this is what the ocean, this is what being in nature, this is what being in the Amazon and working with these medicines in a respectful, reciprocal way. I need to highlight that using the, you know, you're turning to these medicines, asking permission to use these medicines and, uh, and then working with them and the indigenous healers in a respectful, reciprocal way. Because my kind has tried to destroy them. My kind has tried to erase them from the earth and take everything. And so I walk into those, into that setting in a, in a really, in as, in as humble a way as I possibly can. I'm a goofball, but I, you know, as, as, as respectful as I possibly can. And, uh, and, 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 and I, and I, so I go, you know, I go there and, and I, I go into nature to, to come back to process, to come back to, um, like, I want to feel, I want to feel kin. I want to feel like I'm kin to lava, mm. right? I want to feel like lava is my brother. I want to feel like the wind is my sister. I want to, to see my, see myself or see all of us in a mountain stream here in Virginia, where I live, you know, like that's my end game. If there is an end game, I want to let go and I want to surrender and sink into that kinship, which involves non-separation. Because when you experience the truth of non-separation, you, you're not interested in, the, the three cherries lined up in a row at the slot machine. <laughs> you know, you're interested in the cherry blossoms that are having their way with you as they, as they, as they float down on your, on your head, as you sit under that tree, you know, that is, it's that kind of, it's that kind of reverie, right? It's the shepherd, you know, uh, you know, under the, uh, you know, sitting with his flocks, you know, it's at, 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 at sunset in the fields. We've lost that. We've lost that. And, and there are many people, though, who are trying to reclaim it. 
and 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 I'm uh, you know, and I, and I count myself one of them, uh, trying to reclaim it and trying to encourage other people to claim it, not to self-aggrandize, but because I think our very survival depends on it. We have to rest and digest. We have to be in reverie. We have to feel ourselves as a single ocean. Mm -hmm. And then we won't maybe kill each other. And, you know, the way, the way, the way that we're killing each other and killing takes many forms. The, yeah, that's an important note. And I, I, so I certainly want to get into ecology. Um, I want to understand why or how you got so connected with ayahuasca in particular and oh, what it was gosh. about that process. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't even want to know this story. I mean, you've, you've read the book, but, mm -hmm. but I will say that I've just, it's more like my readers, my listeners out there. I mean, it's, it's so, um, uh, it's so unromantic. I was, uh, like, like many of us out there, like many people listening, I was um, I was walking a suicidal path. I had reached a point in 2019 where I was um, I was essentially killing myself. I was in the process of of killing myself and um, putting myself in really really dangerous situations, um, and um, and using substances in a way that that definitely could have killed me. Um, and I didn't care. So I was walking a suicidal path. I was desperate. Um, talk therapy wasn't working. Uh, mainline pharmaceuticals were not working. Um, they just made me feel dead inside. Um, even more, even maybe even more dead than I already felt. And so I went, I ended up, it's a long, to make a long story short, you know, I went, uh, well, I, I read Michael, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change mm -hmm. Your Mind. That that came to me um, serendipitously, like it has many, has like just like it's come serendipitously to so many other people at just the right moment. And uh, and he talked, of course, about the therapeutic therapeutic use of of psychedelics, which was a completely new concept to me. I just I had no idea of this. I was not someone who was on YouTube watching people smoking the toad or whatever, or I, I wasn't, I wasn't listening to Joe Rogan or any podcast like that. I didn't know anything about it. I was a good boy in terms of chemicals in my life. I, I, I really hadn't used a whole lot of, 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 of things. Uh, so, um, with some exceptions. So anyway, I ended up going on Reddit and I, I found a an ayahuasca center with the most upvotes. And John, I got on a plane and I went there. And that is how it began. Mm -hmm. I also read a scientific paper uh, in the course of my limited Google searches that um, that talked about ayahuasca as a potential PTSD um, uh, medicine treatment and it was a researcher named it named Antonio and Sarah out of out of McGill University and I read this this paper and that also gave me a lot of hope and because I had been diagnosed with complex PTSD so I went to Dreamglade I went to this I went to this this ayahuasca center in Peru and had um a really difficult a really transformative time and that is how I started um that is how I read it. Most upvotes. It. I was lucky. I was real yeah. lucky. I was really the lucky. Path, the path comes in mysterious ways. You know, <laughs> definitely. I does. think it must. I, I think it <laughs> must because uh, you know a lot of, a lot could have gone really wrong, and it, mm -hmm. and it didn't. Especially if I'd been a, a a female, I think going down there can be can be oh, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it was also dangerous for me to stay where I was, and I had to do something mm -hmm. big, and so I uh, so I so I did. And uh, and that kind of began my exploration with 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 ayahuasca and plant medicines. But but you were you were referencing earlier. There's a whole culture you were <clears throat> becoming a part of, or at least honoring. You know, you were you're, so talk a bit about context. What you learned from maybe some of the differences between how you were being approached here from 
uh-huh. in a healing community and how you approach there in a healing community? Uh, well, uh, in the United States, um, people are interested in either your story or they're interested in symptom reduction. Mm-hmm. Like you're depressed. Well, let me give you this pill that may or may not make you feel 50% less depressed or 25% less depressed. Let me, this will take the edge off of your depression. Maybe, maybe. So it was very, they were either interested in the story or they were interested in kind of like, uh, with pharmaceuticals, like this is something, and, and I'm speaking about my experience. Other people have had very different experiences mm-hmm. with these with these pharmaceuticals. I'm not, I'm in no way demonizing these 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 you know, antidepressants and so forth. I'm not, I'm not demonizing them, but for me, they did not work, and for many people, they don't work. For some people, they do, um, but they don't. You know, it's not like life is zippity doo da after you work after your you know after, after you take Zoloft. Uh, for most people, it's, you know, it's, it's usually a, uh, uh, it's, it's usually a, not a total, totally satisfying, uh, symptom relief, let's That's say. Well said. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Totally. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. I, Cause I, I think through a lot of folks right now that I've worked with and that yeah. uh, there are a few who are just lights on, yeah. you know, you take an antidepressant and it is lights on and more power to you. Mm-hmm. And that's the mentality of like, yeah, if it works, great. But yep. when it's your only bad metaphor, but tool in the toolbox, you know, you're, you're so limited mm-hmm. and, and then you feel like it's not working or you're somehow failing or, and, and, and there are so many people in communities of healing that are more than happy to blame you for what's not working. You know, you're not oh, doing yeah. it well enough. You're not practicing yep. hard, you know, like all kinds of, so yes, totally aligned. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that they were, you know, it was all about, it was all either about telling a therapist my story Mm -hmm. or it was, it was, let me turn the dial of your suffering down a few notches. So that's how it felt. And, and let's do that. Um, Let's do that. Uh, Let's have multinational corporations profit from that. Um very incomplete, <laughs> very uneven um, healing. And I mean, I'm putting that in quotation marks. So that's kind of how I, how I experienced the Western modality of healing. And then when I went to Peru, I experienced, and this, you know, this is my experience at this particular um, ayahuasca retreat center where there were two indigenous uh, curanderos there, which is um, this sort of a Spanish word for healer. Um, you might think of it as a shaman, but I'm not, like many people, I'm not so wild about that word shaman. But in any case, there were two Shipibo uh, indigenous uh, healers there. Uh, and there were, but it was it was owned by some gringos. And there were facilitators mm-hmm. there who were, who were gringos. And um, to make a long story short, uh, the experience was about the process. Like you drink the medicine, you, I mean, I'm one of those people who, you know, you give me, you give me some ayahuasca and it's not that people say, oh, it lasts four or five hours. It's like, for me, it's 12. I mean, it's it like goes on forever yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really sensitive to it. So, so it was, um, it was absolutely a process that I had to undergo. It was a process that I had to, it felt like surgery and in a lot of ways on my soul and on my brain. Um, but a loving, a loving righteous, I guess you could say surgery, soul surgery, neurological surgery. And, um, and, and I learned more as, you know, as it's almost a cliche now, but you know, those, that first ceremony was meant more to me than almost all the 20 years of therapy that I'd ever, that I had had. And I woke up, I woke up in a lot of ways after that, just that one ceremony. So it wasn't just a little bit of, it wasn't just a few notches uh, taken off of my suffering. It was, it's, I mean, ayahuasca is a wrap to get into the science a little bit, you know, it's a, it's a rapid antidepressant. 
Zoloft takes two weeks, three weeks, to show uh, uh, help, to show uh, symptom reduction, if it shows up at all. But ayahuasca is a rapid antidepressant, and so, and it's and it's in, it's more than just a few notches. Like you feel better right away, um, and so that is so different from you know some of these pharmaceuticals that I had uh, worked with. Now, in terms of the talking, you know, these these facilitators, not not the not the indigenous curanderas, but the, but the gringo kind of facilitators and owners of this of this of this retreat center, who were so patient with me and so wonderful in so many ways, um, you know, they let me talk, but at a certain point, they said what therapists would never say to me, which is let it go. Mm -hmm. Stop talking about it. Feel in your heart what you want from life. Feel the jewels, feel the gifts, feel the blessings that the medicine manifested for you, that, sh that, the, that the medicine sh showed you. And take that in. Be quiet. You know, you are so so uh, you are so much bigger than your story. You're so much bigger than your trauma. And um, there's so much more to life than your trauma. There's so much more to life than your abuse history. Um, and you will forgive your parents. And when you forgive your parents, you will be bulletproof. These were some of the things that were said to me. No therapist had ever said these things to me. And so there was a lot of tough, there was a lot of tough love from that retreat center and from other, um, other, uh, other, other curanderos that I worked with. They, they just, they just didn't want to hear my story. And they weren't interested in symptom reduction. They were interested in transformation. Mm -hmm. They were interested in transmutation. They were interested in the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. And so hot diggity damn, that was a very seismic shift in my life. And I had to face, right? It's not, it's not like when on these ayahuasca journeys, it's not like I, I had any reprieve from the past. It's, that's not it at all. We know that 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 ayahuasca is an anti amnesiac. It allows the recovery of repressed memories. It causes uh, fear. The fear ex causes fear extinction, right? In traumatic memories, so that the memory is still. It's not like you forget the memory, but the fear associated with that memory is liberated it's 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 the as the traumatic to put it in more technical technical terms as the traumatic memory reconsolidates after you remember it the fear doesn't go along with it as much as it reconsolidates and so that is that's part of the miracle that's part of the miracle of these of these medicines if they're used in a safe setting with safe people who know what they're doing. In the wrong hands, under the wrong circumstances, these medicines can be dangerous. They can. And I'll say that. I'm, I'm happy to say that. I'm not a psychedelic evangelist. I think that people have to be really, really careful about where they're going, who they're drinking with, and what they're drinking. Do they know what they're drinking? And I had the fortune in Brazil of actually making my medicine. I, I picked the chacruna leaves, and I, you know, and I, 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 I scraped the bark of the vine, and I mean, I made, I made some of the medicine that I drank. But you don't. That's not always the case. Uh, and so you've got to be really, really careful. And if there's one thing that I wish I'd emphasize more in my book. It's that you've got to be careful because you do have to be careful because it's so it's, it's your 
you're, you're opening up in these very, very big ways. And so you have to have the right, to use a technical term, the right inputs. You have to have the right inputs. If you have a shady shaman or you're surrounded by just strange energy or whatever, it's, 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 it's not a good thing. It's better, it's better to not go because then you can just be re-traumatized. So mm -hmm. um, you've got to be very choosy. Um, but if, if you can find the right people and you can find the right medicine in the right setting and you've done your, your, your legwork, you've done your preparation work, it can be total. the process, the process can be totally transformative. You mentioned earlier about the science and in line with yeah, mm -hmm. that's tr transformation in this way is, um, yeah, it, it's not really talked about in because because it's 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 not measurable, it's not it's not replicatable, and so it it doesn't necessarily fall in line with some of the, I mean, what we call science is a method. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily fit with the method. So what we right. do is we kick it out. We say, we don't, we don't get that. And so what, what have you learned about the science that supports your experience in oh. ayahuasca work? <laughs> you know, I should say, I should say too, that John, I brought, so, so, so you've, you've had a taste of, of like high school, middle school, nerdy Greg in science class. I brought a binder mm. of peer reviewed science articles with me <laughs> to the retreat center yeah and i took out the three hole punch i did the whole thing you know i created a, a little binder and i i brought that that puppy with me to peru and i and it actually was next to me during those ceremonies because mm. it was the science first communicated to me mm. by michael pollan through his book it was the mm. science that helped me with set and setting mm. It was helping with set and setting because I didn't, I don't, tr you know, part of it because, because as I say in the book, you know, complex PTSD is a disorder of trust. After you, after you live in a traumatic um, environment for your childhood and adolescence and you can't escape, you learn not to trust people. So, but I did trust science and I still trust science, right? I still trust, you know, the, the, the process of it. All of its findings aren't always correct, but that's part of the right. scientific method. But anyway. So I trusted science. So I brought this binder with me. I had it next to me. I probably pooped on it. I might have bar barfed on it. I mean, I, yes, I did poop. In I actually course. shit the I shit the bed the first time. Most, I shit, most shit yeah, the bed. you sh yes, shit I the shit bed, it. shit your pants. Like, yes, yes. I mean, I won't even go into it. I mean, a lot of it isn't even in the book. But I shit it. So it may have had some fecal <laughs> matter on it. This this binder, but <laughs> it was next to me, and I held. I mean, I would touch it during this. I would just reach over and be like. Because in the worst moments, I would say to myself, as I was reliving traumatic experiences, mm. right, as the anti-amnesiac quality of the medicine was working, as the traumatic memories were reconsolidating and the fear was being liberated from them, and the neuro, you know, plasticity was occurring and all these things, I would, I would, I would remember, right, I would remember the science that I would touch that binder and I... Um, and it, and it, it, it gave me faith. It, that was my faith, right? At that mm -hmm. point, that was the faith that I had. It wasn't a faith in this. It was a faith in, it was a faith in science. So, um, yeah, so we know that um, ayahuasca increases mindfulness. We know that it increases divergent thinking, which if we're going to survive, we've got to think about problems in a new way, in different ways. It um, encourages pro-social behaviors. Um it encourages not only neuroplasticity, uh, which is you know right new, new new synaptic pathways being being formed, but it actually promotes the um, the the birth of new neurons, which we thought was impossible, right? Neurogenesis. Right. If there's one, if there are two words in the English language that are the most that give me the most. Um, uh, giving the most pleasure <laughs> it's neurogenesis and neuroplasticity because that's where it's at 
if we're going to if we're going to upend systemic racism, if we're going to if we're going to if we're, if we're going to defend the planet and reclaim, uh, you know, the, the, the earth uh, and, and her um, and her beautiful ecosystems, we're going to have to think we're going to have to think in a different way. We're going to have to relate in a different way. And so those are the two most hopeful words for me in the English language, neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. It's where it's at. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, learning, right? Just, just learning. We, we say, you know, we're here to learn. And, and like, you know, if we're learning, if we're growing, there is neuroplasticity. There maybe isn't necessarily neurogenesis, but there's neuroplasticity. And so we need, we need, we need more mindfulness. We need more divergent thinking. Um, we, uh, it's, it helps with anxiety. Um, it helps obviously with PTSD, the healing of traumatic memories. Um, and it also, um, there's research that points to psychedelics promoting nature relatedness, mm -hmm. which is another way of saying you learn to be mothered by the earth. You learn to feel in kinship with the earth. You learn to care about the earth. Um, so those, that's a taste of some of the science. And, and my book has, uh, it draws on 70, it's a memoir, but it, it, it draws on 70 peer-reviewed um, scientific articles, many of which are about plant, plant medicine. And I'm going to have on my website a, a resource where people right. can go and actually um, see the science and, and, and they're linked to those articles so they, they can see for themselves this exciting research out of Johns Hopkins, out of Imperial College London and other places. Um, that that's 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 so exciting um what's your website uh it's greg ren.com g-r-e-g-w-r-e-n-n -E -E yeah that's Good. that's it okay. so i'm gonna have that up on there uh, for folks and because people may be skeptical you know and they should be skeptical and they should oh, be skeptical yeah. of who's of who's serving them medicine and where where you know, they, they should be thinking critically about all of this and and they shouldn't be brewing it in their garage um, and going into the park at, at the middle, in the middle of the night to drink this. It's, it's uh, you, you, you've got to, you've got to find the right people and, uh, and that can be difficult, but, um, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of, there's a lot of great science um, out there um, that, that, that shows this. So yeah, and I, uh, just to comment on that too, though, like, cause I think some of the, when when psychotherapy is done really well, it I had a, a Jungian analyst that I'm friends with who's been on the podcast, Mackenzie Amara. She said, Well, psychoanalysis is an acid trip. You know, there's there's an alternate state, there's an intention, there's an experience, there's an integration, there's a change your life and you know, it's more of a slow drip, but it's um when it's done for the purpose of transformation and not symptom reduction, I think it could be very, and also creating meaningful, deeply intimate relationship and letting the relationship be the medicine. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, you know, powerful dimension to the, the, the process. And in part, what happens, I think, is people imagine they're going to go have a, an experience on ayahuasca or LSD or psilocybin or whatever it is, and that that experience singularly is transformative when that's partially true, but it's also how you fold in your life the experiences that you've had. And mm -hmm. when you have a cultural context like a Peruvian tradition that you, the Shipibo tradition that you got connected with, th then you, ha you have this cultural integration process that helps you understand what's happening to you. Or, because if you don't, what happens to anybody that goes down to South America and has an ayahuasca experience and then goes right back into their life? Mm -hmm. They forget about it. It, it, yes. it was a, it's a, it's a fleeting dream. It's a, it's a yeah. distant memory. You know, it, it offered no transformation in your life. Oh. And so we don't, it's, it, we don't have any culture. Well, that's not true. That's too strong. We, we struggle to find cultural containers for ecstatic experience where we, in the truest definition of the term ecstasis, where we get beside ourselves or get outside of ourselves and see our rout routine habituated selves from a different perspective. And that's not arguable. You, you can't, you know, it's not like the data in the scientific article where I can say yes or no, good or bad. It's, mm -hmm. do you, back to your poetry comment, which I love, do you take your inner world seriously? Does that matter to mm -hmm. you? Does the, 
does the experience of your uh, of that totally unique 100% private experiential aspect of consciousness does that lead you anywhere or does it matter and i mean you're certainly an example of somebody that follows the yellow brick road in, oh, in my healthy gosh. ways <laughs> well thank you i mean talk to my husband but um, <laughs> talk to my talk, wife. Talk to, yeah, sure. Yeah, to, yes, yeah. right. We're, we're yeah. yes, yeah. But you know, actually, it's uh, I loved what you said about you know people going to Peru, having you know an ayahuasca ayahuasca experience, and then coming back, and it's just like a dream that yeah, it's almost it didn't didn't happen. And that brings me to another um, aspect of the science which has to be um, highlighted, which. Um, which is maybe the most exciting part of this whole, uh, of, of, for me in terms of psych, the most exciting aspect of psychedelic research right now. And this is um, out of, uh, well, it was out of Johns Hopkins, but now Berkeley because uh, Gould, Gould Dolan, maybe you've heard of this researcher, mm -hmm. Gould Dolan. She was at, at, at Hopkins and she just moved to Berkeley. But in any case, she was the researcher who gave MDMA to octopuses. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so her research has shown that psychedelics reopen critical periods of development. I'm so glad you brought this in because that have you I heard may about have, this. Well, just in your book, you know, I mean, well, no. Yes, I've heard about it. And I just read it in your book. Okay. And I'm so glad we're diving into this because that oh, study. It's so, important. it's so good. It is yeah. so good. And it, it's it's so relevant. And, and this is what I mean in terms of inputs. Yeah. Right. That we. um that that when you do, so I just you know, just so your listeners understand what I mean by this is you know a critical period of development is a period of time in your life when you are highly susceptible to certain types of learning, mm -hmm. where you're really primed for certain types of learning and conditioning. So there's a critical period of development in a zebra finch. I mentioned this in the book, right? where in the first, I think, 60 days or so of a zebra finch's life, that is the critical period for learning how to sing. Yeah. And if a, if, a, if, a, if a zebra finch does not hear another zebra finch sing in that, in that first 60 days, it will never sing. So mm -hmm. you could go 80 days out if it's never heard birds, a zebra finch song, it, it 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 can't learn how to sing at 80 days it has to be before you know it has to be in that critical period and so human beings have critical periods for um social reward learning and so um we you know i learned my social reward learning um first from my parents they were not necessarily the best people to be teaching me that and it set me up for a lot of um, a lot of misery, let's say, uh, in relationship with others, but also in relationship with myself. Mm. And so no wonder I got to the point in my life where I was walking a suicidal path. So what the medicines do is that what ayahuasca does is it reopens critical periods of development for, say, social reward learning. So, so that person who goes to, to Peru has the ayahuasca experience, they've got to be really, really careful about what they do for the next four weeks. Because ayahuasca, it's a little unclear about how long it reopens those critical periods of development. It looks like it's about a month or so, about four weeks. You've got to be really careful about what you're exposing yourself to. Because if you're going back to the porn, if you're going back to the hard drug use, or you're going back to the abusive relationship, or um, you're going back to kind of business as usual in your life, then the crazy, uh, nutty kind of business as usual in your life, then you're just, the critical period is open, but you're, you're just teaching yourself what you've, you're reinforcing stuff that you were trying to heal in the first place, right? Yeah. You're trying to fix. And so you've got, so to, so I, you know, it's a luxury, right? But you've got to be, you've got to take time. You've got to take yeah. time for yourself. 
and make sure you're get, you're 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 getting the right inputs. Just like that zebra finch needs good inputs in those first sixty days or so of its life. Um, so I can't stress that enough. You know, the preparation work is important, mm -hmm. but this is what we mean when we say integration. Yeah, this is what we mean when we say, when we say integration. Integration is making the best use of t uh, of the time you have when those critical periods are reopened to sculpt and learn things because that brain is malleable. It's so coachable after a psychedelic experience. Ketamine, for example, many of your listeners may have, may have worked with ketamine. That reopens their critical periods of development for maybe 48 hours. That's nothing to sneeze at. For those two days, you've got to, you have to, they're precious. It's precious, precious time. You don't want to squander on Pornhub or mm -hmm. drinking yourself silly, right? You've got to be really careful about what you're exposing yourself to. And, uh, and so that's, that's, um, that, that science, we, you know, we, we can't, we, we can't not talk about it. It's, it's just so, so exciting and so important, um, but it really raises the stakes, right? And shows that the ceremony is just one part of the whole healing picture when it comes to psychedelic assisted therapy, we'll say. Well, and, and, and the ceremony just what what occurs to me right there is like the ceremony begins at intention on some level, you know, you're as the, as you hear in a lot of these circles, the medicine starts working on you. And yes, when, when you, when you've stopped imagining that the medicine is actually the substance, it, it it's not just the substance. It's the process to go with our theme here. You know, the, who, who do you talk to? Who do you share it with? How do you, change your life in meaningful ways? How do you intentionally shift your routines? How do you um, be mindful about your consumption? You know, and uh, like we just, I don't know, I, I can get a little cr critical of certain aspects of Western culture, but you know, we, we don't do that at all. And mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the concerns about psychedelics in this, certainly in the West, certainly in the United States, is that the culture itself doesn't have the structure and the bed of, um, observation of philosophy worldview of orientation of lineage of tradition to support these experiential processes and so you just you know you go back to work and snort cocaine and you know go have some sex you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. it's but that that's yeah. uh, you're you're bringing something in i've studied this a long time and you're mm -hmm. you're emphasizing this in a in an insightful way for me, like as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, wow, that is really radical. The hypnosubjective aspect, the hypnosubjective aspects of two weeks, four weeks. You know, this is why neo-Nazi groups use psilocybin, and like th there is a that that's the very real concern about what we could call spirits or, or toxic mm -hmm. perspective that can infect your. Um, your interior and and then you live that out yeah. unconsciously and wow so thanks for that that was insightful well and, and you could also be you could stay at a retreat center that was shady like you could you could have your ceremonies you can and you could stay there for two or three months and you could think yeah. oh i'm i'm not going i'm not i'm, not, I'm out of the matrix i'm here i'm healing i'm integrating i'm in i'm in community but there may be things going on there that are um shall we say dysfunctional oh yeah and so you don't you know it, it that, that that can be in i mean we have to be you know it's important to, to highlight that you know it's we're talking about we're talking about the real world as being sick and and being really careful in that critical period when those critical periods are reopened after a ceremony but you know that can be in medicine communities too mm -hmm. and so you want to be you want to be really careful about um, who you're, who you're around, who you're, you know, not to get paranoid about it, but just make sure that there's, that a place has a good reputation and make sure that you take time for yourself and, and, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always a crapshoot and it's yeah. in some ways it's always a crapshoot and, 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 and you are dealing with human beings, right? You're not dealing with, 
you know, ideals with with two, with two legs and and two arms. It's not like it's not like that. That we aren't we aren't that. But um, but we we do our best. But but, but yes, be mindful of 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 where you are, uh, re-entering. Be really be really mindful of that. And and that isn't talked about enough. It's not talked about enough. And uh, mm -hmm. so I'm, I, I'm yeah. We have to start closing out in a little bit, and I want sure. to be conscious of that. And I think we've got, I've got too many questions for the amount of time that we have. Um, <laughs> but um, I, two things, you know, you said divine feminine earlier, mm -hmm. and I, I want, I just want to shake that and see what happens, you know, and, and so what the divine feminine is, and then also as we're closing out, just thinking through any threads that you didn't get to or that were mm -hmm. dropped through our conversation. So those two, mm -hmm. two directions. Well, I think one thing that one thing I want to communicate, one thing I want to convey that I that I feel like I have to convey, and this is something that uh, involves the divine feminine, um, is the waking up of my ecological conscience. Right. So one thing we don't talk about enough, I don't think, in medicine communities, um, is service and it's like we talk about personal healing a lot but i think that one thing that we need to talk about more is you know you're know, using these med medicines to wake up to awaken social concern in us to awaken the desire to i guess heal other people or not heal other people exactly but heal the planet or to take care of each other better to take care of the planet, to take care of our society better. And so, uh, so, so how that worked out for me is, like I said, I was, I was walking a suicidal path. I was, um, as you read the book, you will see, I was very much an addict, um, spending most of my oh, free time, uh, engaging in addictive behaviors and very selfish um, hurting myself and what I, what I came to in the course of living out my life is I came to, as I've discussed, I, there, there has been a lot of healing and by healing, I mean, coming back to wholeness. And so not perfection, wholeness, more wholeness, not complete wholeness, but more wholeness. And so to, to, just to boil it down, Mother Earth healed me. She healed me. She healed me when I was snorkeling with my mother. She healed me when I was diving in Raja Ampat, 10,000 10, miles away from my family, I should say. Remember, you don't have to, you don't have to go to Indonesia to heal. I just needed someplace 10,000 miles for my family. <laughs> okay. And I had a, I had a credit card that could make that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, so, so that healing happened in, in, in Indonesia and it happened for me in nature here in Virginia. And it happened that healing took place for me in South America. And it, and the, the common thread is nature. It was nature. It wasn't, it wasn't plastic. It wasn't humanity necessarily that did that. Um, although humanity, there were lots of humans who helped me along the way. So to boil it down, you know, mother nature healed me. I have her to thank these beautiful medicines, these beautiful ecosystems, so fragile, so endangered that woke up, that woke up concern and compassion and, and, and care inside of me. Um, and so when someone has saved your life, you want to save theirs. You want to give back. It's reciprocal healing. It's something that we've known forever. It's what indigenous cultures have known forever. It's reciprocal healing. It's like you, you, you saved me, and I want to save you. I, you healed me. I want to heal you. And so, um, that. And so, so yes, mother. I say mother nature, but the spirit of ayahuasca. Madra Ayahuasca, who appears to you in these journeys, to me and to many other people, she is 
a manifestation of the divine mother and she's a she's a she's a manifestation of mother earth and so um i i have a relationship with her i have i have a, i mean i believe in the goddess <laughs> i don't, I don't want to say i believe in god I, i'm i'm careful on that i believe in i believe in goddess <laughs> i'm i'm an absolute i i Saul de Paul. I mean, I, I believe in, in goddess and I believe in her care. I believe that we're adored and we're guided and I feel an intense devotion to her, but I feel that devotion to her um, because she saved my life. I would be dead. Hmm. And so I, th I want, I want, I want listeners to understand that, that that's that relationship is so important to me and it's more important than, than, um, than maybe any other human relationship that I have. It's more central to my life. It makes all my human relationships possible. And I got the mother I never had. Yeah. I mean, isn't that like, wow. I, I got the mother I, I never had. Whoa. Right. Who's not, who's not going to hurt me. Who's not. I mean, she can be fierce. Sure. And she might, she, I may get killed. You know, I may get murdered, whatever. I'm, but, but I know that I'm eternal. I know that we're eternal and I don't, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid of dying. Um, and so I got the mother I never had. I got, I got, I got the mother that's actually better than any human mother. Sorry, moms mm -hmm. out there. And so that, you know, that, that might be an unpopular kind of perspective, but that's my experience and it's, and it's kept me alive and it, it's enabled me to, it's enabled me to, to stand tall. And, you know, despite everything I've experienced, it's, it's enabled me to stand tall and to, to learn to be less selfish and to, to actually to be a mother to other people. I'm a man, but I'm a, I mean, I think of myself as a father figure to, to my students, but also as a, as a mother figure. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am, I'm cis, you know, cisgendered man, but I, I still consider myself a mother figure because I want to manifest that, that care that my grandmother showed me and that, and that, um, that mother nature has shown me. I, I want to communicate that in my words and in my teaching. No, you certainly um, do that. That's inspiring. Try. So yeah. I, you know, I, I, um, I'm just so glad I got to talk to you about all this stuff and you, and you seem like you, I, I, I you seem like, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a beautiful journey. It's hard. I, I my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is from Mark Plotkin. He's an ethnobotanist that was down in, he was a protege of Richard Schultes. Uh -huh. And he said to me, you know, it's funny with the indigenous folks, they say, your drugs make you feel better and then worse. Our drugs make us feel worse and then better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. I Brain think if Zoloft three... made people shit themselves that wouldn't that wouldn't that wouldn't work with their yeah. business model yeah. but apparently some of our potato chips do cause anal leakage so that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh lestra yes yeah, that's, that's been it's been a long time i remember that i remember i remember dan rather telling me about that on, yes. on the cbs evening news that's right yes that's right look greg I, I what a joy i mean i it's so the sacred path I'm on where I, where I get the beautiful privilege, talk about privilege of reading mm -hmm. a book and then talking to the creator of that text. I, I don't, I don't approach this lightly and I feel so grateful that you made the time and that you also produce this work for people to connect with and be in their own process of being mothered by your mothering process. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to talk to you. And, and you, um, I can already tell you're, you're, you're transforming lives, you know, in your, in your practice and in your podcasts. And, um, and so I, um, I consider you a brother. Thank you. I'll take that. Really hot in that, you know, disconnected as we may be in time and space, but, or in space, but, 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 um, but I am really, really I glad to meet you. I talked, I talked with a guy once who, who worked with a lot of the native indigenous traditions in the North America. 
And he would say, all oh, these teachers used to begin each conversation with family. Let's, uh, let's talk, you know? So it, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of our, it, it's a deeper reality that, that we're family than mm -hmm. we, we even understand. Mm -hmm. And that's a real joy, man. Uh, as, as, uh, wow. I mean, again, I told you earlier, I, I wept when I finished your book and it was so beautiful and necessary and a somatic expression of just the pain of mm -hmm. existence, you know, and the hurts that we accumulate throughout life and mm -hmm. your bravery right. to your bravery of actually following the yellow brick road and the capacity that you have to write about it is, uh, mm -hmm. is appreciated. So it's good to be your brother. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I, um, and I remember the people who are still struggling. And I also remember the people who are getting better and, 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 um, and, you know, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people doing just what I did mm -hmm. in, in, in their own way. And, and they're, they're healing in a variety of ways. And, yeah. and most of them aren't writers, but right. I, you know, and I, I stand, I stand in solidarity with them and I, I can't wait to meet them and, and on the book tour. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh